Hello everyone, my name is Shane McElroy and welcome to all of you joining us on the third of our Momentum for Milk live webinars happening this week. We have a number of important topics for you today that we'll cover off in advance of the new milking season. Later on, we'll hear from Thomas Ryan, Head of Agri Sustainability and Customer Relations on the sustainability action payment, as well as an update on the changes to the nitrates regulations. Before Thomas, we'll now get an update from Eamon Comiskey, Regional Milk Supply Manager in Tierlon and John Brennan, Senior Business Manager, who will take us through some of the key messages from milk quality and dairy hygiene to get the new season off to the best start. So for today's interactive session, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions from our technical expert speakers uh, and how to manage these areas. Uh, we'll have a couple of short presentations from our speakers now, and then we'll have a question and answer session. I encourage everyone to uh, submit your questions by text message, the number it will be on the screen, and we'll try to go through as many of those as we can. Uh, the webinar today will be recorded and will be available afterwards via Tierland Farm Life and on our YouTube channel. So we'll hopefully run to about 1.45 today with Q&A session, and I'd encourage you to, to put your questions through to our speakers by texting in to 86 And if you want to include your name and county as well, that'll be great to give us a, a sense of where you're, where you're coming from. So look, without further ado, I'll hand over to yourself, Eamon. Thanks very much, Shane, and thanks again to everybody for joining on what is undoubtedly a very busy time of year on farms. With that in mind, we have a couple of timely pieces here to go through that should allow people to have a smooth start to the milking season. So before everybody starts milking, ideally the milking parlour and the bulk tank should be fully serviced. So your main points that need to be right is your pulsation in your in your milk and parlour, your vacuum levels, and obviously all rubberware should be changed at the correct intervals. As well as that, before milk, before starting the milk, you should do a full wash routine on the plant. So a full caustic wash, hot wash, and a full descale wash, just to make sure that everything is nice and clean before we start off. It's very important that you book your collection before you start milking. So in order to make sure that milk is not any more than three days old, in order to allow time for collection to be organized at what's a very busy time of year for hauliers as well as managing the return to milk, if you could contact your milk supply manager ahead of putting milk into the tank, it just allows time for all of that, all of the pieces to work together. It's important to remember as well that the, the minimum collection volume is 400 litres, and as well as that, to take care with small volumes of milk. So. If there's a small volume of milk in your tank after your first, even your second milking, and it's not coming up to the bottom of the agitator and the milk is not agitating, you're going to have inconsistent cooling. And what, what that's going to cause is you're going to have hot spots within the milk that don't cool at all. You're going to have freezing up the sides of the tanks and all of this leads to extremely high TBCs and that's not good for anybody. It's important as well to be very cautious around antibiotic residues. We'd encourage every supplier at this stage to purchase a charm kit for testing at home. These are available on Tierlown Farm Life. And if you purchase these online, there's also a training available via milk supply managers. It's important as well to remember that there should be no residues of colostrum or teat sealer residues going into the bulk tank for milk that's going to be collected. So to that end, milk from the first eight milkings from a cow after calving should not be entering the bulk tank. And move on, Shane. So the next section we look at is just managing somatic cell counts at this time of year. So one of the most important things that you'll do at this stage is focusing on good hygiene within the housing. So keeping cubicles clean down twice a day, keeping them lined, sawdust, all the good things, um, keeping passageways clear between cubicles, entry and exit to milk and parlours, all hugely important. Also an important point on that is keeping your calving areas and your calving boxes regularly cleaned out. So depending on the level of traffic through them, the level of calving activity, you may be needing to be cleaning out those once, twice a week. Maybe not 
necessarily power washing out, but removing all loose material and fresh bedding is it's hugely important to keep the bacteria loading low. Your milking routine, it's very important to start out the year as you mean to go on. So get the gloves in, get the gloves ordered, you know, a good routine, making sure the environment is clean within the parlor, making sure the milker is clean, clean hands, cleaning down them gloves at the end of a row, disinfecting the hands, all hugely important. Using a good teeth disinfectant and making sure that you are using it correctly. So rather than spraying cows as they're running out by you in the parlor, taking your time, making sure you're making sure you're getting good coverage with that teeth disinfectant. It's always a good idea to do a check on yourself. We've all seen at this stage after spraying teeth, teeth disinfectant onto a teeth and wrap the paper towel around it. It will give you a good idea if you're getting good coverage. Milk recording, it's a good idea to get milk recording ordered or get it booked in for early on in the season. The last thing you want to be doing is having a number of cows with issues early on in the season, which can cause cross contamination and result in high, high SECs for the remainder of the year. There are some simple management tools out there. The CMT paddle, the California milk test can identify infected quarters. So it can, can bring it down to one or two quarters and identify exactly where your problem is and the quarter that you need to treat. Milk culturing then is available via, via Central Lab in Dungarvan, and that will help you to identify the bacteria type that's causing your issue and give you your appropriate treatment. So obviously of huge importance then to milk quality is managing TBC and thermogenic levels. Some of the most important stuff that you'll do around that is checking your water. So checking water temperatures for starts, we're looking for a start temperature of 75 degrees. And the important point with that is your dump temperature should be between that 50, 55 degrees Celsius. To achieve that dump temperature, 75 degrees at the start is, is generally a bare minimum. Um, something that's often overlooked then is water hardness. So if you have very hard water, it can do a couple of things. Some detergents, the efficacy of the detergent will be reduced, but also, you will have more mineral deposits within your, within your milking plant with hard water. So a good idea to get your water checked. Is it hard? Would you benefit from the installing of a water softener? If you already have a softener, in, is there salts in it? Has it been regular checked? The next point on your water as well is your quantity of water within your wash trots. Is there enough water there? So we're talking nine to 10 liters for, for rinsing, 14 to 15 liters per unit for your main washes. It's important that, that you have enough water there. Check your detergents. Is there enough detergent going into your washes? So if you have an automatic system, do the tubing need changed? It's a good idea if you have automatic systems to put some detergent into a jug and see how much has been sucked up and compare that with your protocols from your detergents company. Acid washes minimum once twice, three times per week. Ensure that that's built into your program. And again, that you're following the protocol that was provided by your, your provider. And should you consider using paracetic acid in the final rinse? Um, it's a good backstop against any issues. It, it, it disinfects the parlor. It disinfects water. Uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to use it. So I think that's me, Shane, if I want to pass on to John Brennan, now he's going to cover the next section. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Eamon. Thanks for that. Good afternoon, everybody. And as Eamon said, thanks very much for the opportunity to give you the update uh, in, in, in the middle of this uh, extremely busy season at the moment. So. I suppose what, what I just want to touch on is the actual availability of product and to reiterate some of the points that Eamon made on the simple thing. So I suppose when we look at dairy hygiene and the products that are available to us, we can break them down into two really simple subcategories. So we're looking at our dairy hygiene, which is the dairy detergents that we're looking to clean both our plant and tank. And the other category then is that is our tea care products. So the products that we're using on the cow teat, either pre or post or a combination of both of the milking of the milking cow. Key thing is to actually when we're getting into the, to, to the washing and the cleaning of the plant is the routine. 
to make sure that the routine, whether it's by the relief milker, by the farmer himself, whoever's there, that it's consistent and that the same practice is happening day in, day out. We can't reiterate en more enough the importance of hot water and to actually to know the, the actual tem physical temperature of the water in and out of the plant. It's been said to me a thousand times on different farm levels, sure, it's gold you're going out, but is it actually of the temperature that's required? And more importantly, what is the return temperature of that water? When choosing your detergents, make sure we're choosing detergents of a high specification. So the detergents that we're using to wash the plant to make sure that they have a high caustic inclusion. So a lot of products can be sold and placed in the marketplace based on product name or similarities in the purpose that they're actually going to fulfill in the plant. So actually it's really, really important to know what the active ingredient is in that product the strength of that product and the usage rate of that product. So really, really simple criteria to use. Know what you have, how to use it, and how to get the best performance out of it. Throughout, there's a number of varying wash routines then that will be applicable based on availability of hot water, volume of water required, plant type, plant size, automatic washers. So it is very much farm specific, but there are a number of generic wash routines available across a number of web websites. There are five key components to website or key wash routines that are available to the Chagas website that will cater for probably 90 to 95% if someone is unsure of what is best practice or what they should be doing at farm level. But as always, with your wash routine and your dairy hygiene product selection, feel free to reach out to your branch business manager or the milk quality manager in your area. We've trialed and tested a full range of products, so our three preferred suppliers in the dairy detergent mark will be Grassland Agro, Kilco, and the Diversity Range. We have trialed those in a number of scenarios across the full tier lawn network, and these we find work the best to suit the varying in ranges as Eamon has said, with the varying uh, difference in water quality, water availability, and all the components that are needed to make a really com comprehensive um, quality wash routine. Coupled with this then as well, is just always keep in mind as well, when the, the, the actual physical storage of the product is really, really key. Key is don't buy the year supply, buy probably, you know, at max, five to six months ahead, but ideally three to four months product ahead and make sure to store in a cool, dry place that unfortunately all too often product may be stored in inappropriate conditions and this will actually have a detrimental effect to the lifespan of the product. But as again, reach out to the firm to, for, to check the availability of product and the ideal wash routine, reach out to the milk supply manager. Finally then, just to touch on tea care briefly as well, what are we trying to do with when we're using the tea care here? We're trying to re reduce the bacterial load and reduce, I'm sorry, improve the tea skin condition. We've been using tea care products for decades now at this stage, and it has been proven that the actual use of an appropriate tea care product will reduce the level of mastitis infections, new mastitis infections that it can have in cows. Okay. To eliminate the variability, you know, of that is we recommend that we would use a ready to use product because of the concentration levels of the mixable products, water quality, hardness of water, all that good component, ready to use is the safest, simplest option to go. Eamon touched on it then as well, you know, just to make sure that the level of product, 15 mils per cow per milking, that's the recommended rate. So what should you be looking for in your tea care product? So it's, a, it's a, a singular mix or a component mix of chlorohexidine, chlorohexidine plus a lactic acid, or a lactic acid plus a salicylic acid. So they're the ones that have been proven to control the highest levels of bacteria over the last number of years. And like similar to our detergents, we have similar suppliers of that, Grassland Agro, Diversity, Kilco, and we have a couple of products from the Biocell range as well that we are happy and that will fulfill the components required on those farms levels. But as always, reach out to the milk quality or your business manager to get the best steer and advice and the commercial offering on those products. Thanks, Shane.
John, thanks very much for that. Um, good, good rundown on the on the products that are needed and the importance of uh, of, of choosing good quality products mm -hmm. and to work well together and for the system that uh, that 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 each of our farmers are are, are working. Uh, and thanks as well, Eamon, to uh, to you for 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 the summary of the key tips around and management uh, notes around the. Uh, resuming supply and, and managing smell like cell count and TVCs and thermogenics as well. So guys, there's a few questions coming in, but I'd encourage you to send in, uh, and no doubt you'll have questions on products, you'll have questions on, on milk quality and then resuming supply as well. So throw in your uh, your name and county if it suits. Uh, we have some questions in, but what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll move on now to Thomas. And we'll take questions and answers on all the topics at the end. So Thomas uh, will take us through now the uh, update on the nitrates regulations and also a little bit about the sustainability action payment so over to you Thomas. Okay uh, uh, thank you Shane and thanks for everyone who has joined us uh, on this uh, important webinar so look uh, for the next few minutes I'm really going to talk through some of the key changes to the nitrates regulations uh, and maybe then just finish off an update on the sustainability payment so specifically uh, for the short period we have together touching on things like the changes around the closed period, um, update regarding spreading slurry using low emission slurry spreading, changes around soil water, banding, it's very topical and current, and we'll spend a bit of time around that, around the changes around the excretion rates, uh, looking at soil sampling, additional requirements around buffer strips, and then finishing off regarding the derogation uh, and where that's potentially going. So if we look firstly around the closed period, so from, from this year, uh, the closed period uh, has been extended uh, for slurry, and it's now uh, effective from the 1st of October uh, uh, 2023. Uh, that's for slurry. Uh, for the chemical fertilizer, uh, that ends on the 26th. Uh, the closed period ends on the 26th of January in Zone A, which is for the majority of those on the call. Uh, and for zone B, it's sorry, for, for zone A, it's the 26th uh, today. Uh, for zone B, it's the 29th of January. So our suppliers in Louth and Mead will be paying attention to, to, to that date. And then uh, it's the 14th of February for zone C. So again, our suppliers in Cavan and Monaghan will be thinking about that. Uh, indeed, importantly, there is a provision for slurry spreading and nearly chemical uh, fertilizer uh, where for the minister to make a, a decision around that uh, ministerial decision made by the Minister for Housing in consultation with the Department of Agriculture for the earlier uh, opening uh, of the slurry spreading and the chemical spreading. But that's on a case, year by year, case by case, and there's scientific criteria around that. But just to say that there's provisions in that. If we move on to look at the low emission slurry spreading. Um, so when it comes to low emissions, uh, we've seen changes in that, in that now uh, it's compulsory for 2023 for all farmers who are uh, above a grassland stocking rate of 150 kgs of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, and then you can see how that's incrementally, if you like, uh, uh, moving over the next couple of years. So 2024, uh, compulsory for all farmers above uh, a grassland stocking rate of 130 kgs. And then 2025, it's 100 kgs of nitrogen per hectare. And when they talk about the, the grassland stocking rate, just maybe to spend a minute on that, this is the organic manure produced by the livestock uh, on the farm uh, before any exports, and it's divided by the grassland area of the farm. So the reason that's important is many of your listeners will be aware that when we're talking about the 170 and 250, that's applied on a whole farm basis. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a grassland stocking rate, this 150, 130 and 100, and just to be mindful of that. And then moving on then around from 2023, uh, less for all pig, uh, pig slurry and less for spreading on arable land uh, uh, or else it needs to be incorporated within 24 hours. So look, that's maybe a quick one there, Shane, on the, on the low emission slurry spreading. Moving on then to soil water. Uh, so look, for, for dairy farms, uh, a closed period uh, initially for this year of three weeks is introduced whereby uh, it's no longer, it's prohibited to spread uh, soil water between the 10th of December and the 31st of December. That moves out in that it moves from three weeks to four weeks um, um, for 2024 from the 1st of December, 31st of December, and then 2025 uh, impacting on, on, on winter and liquid suppliers. Equally, because there's the close period uh, around spreading slurry, 
there's the additional requirement around storage facilities, three weeks and four weeks respectively, um, um, as set out there. So maybe moving on now to the to the banding piece, um, and we and we might spend a little bit of time on this. So up until the end of 2022, so up until the end of last year, uh, there was a nitrogen, a set nitrogen excretion rate for all cows of 89 kgs of nitrogen uh, uh, per year. Uh, now, uh, from the 1st of January this year, we now have three bands have, uh, have been put in place. Band one there is where that 92, or where, where that 89 moves to 80. Uh, and that's on the basis of milk yields of, of less than 4,370 litres per cow. Uh, band two, where about two thirds of, of, of dairy farmers nationally sit, that moves uh, from 89 to 92. Uh, and then uh, band three, where uh, about 17% of, 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 of farmers are moving to um, dairy farms are moving to, you can see the nitrogen excretion rate there moves up considerably, moves up to 106. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the banding, this, this, this 80, 92 and 106, the nitrogen excretion rate, so that's based on the average herd milk yield. And so it's the milk yield, not the milk solids, based on the average herd milk yield on a rolling three-year basis or for the preceding year. So it's, so it's if you like, an either or piece here. It's based on average herd milk yield on a rolling three-year basis or for the preceding year. Um, maybe, maybe a couple of call-outs around that is in the coming, uh, so in early February, in the coming week to 10 days, the Department of Agriculture will be writing out to all farmers to set out the whole process and the procedure regarding uh, understanding your banding. Um, they have recognized that uh, ICBF currently both has the, the milk data and the AIMS data and they'll be providing um, uh, they'll be providing opportunity for uh, our suppliers to be able to select uh, and to confirm which band uh, uh, they're in. Uh, and so, look, an important piece here also to highlight. It's also become clear that in the event of a supplier choosing not to confirm which band they're in, the department have indicated that uh, the default position will be to the highest band uh, until. Uh, data is provided uh, uh, by dairy farmers and by our suppliers to to the Department of Agriculture. So look, that's um, that's banding. Uh, maybe if we have a look at soil sampling, the change is there. So regarding regarding soil sampling, um, that's for all farms above a grassland stocking rate of 130 kgs of nitrogen per hectare must take soil samples, uh, and all sown arable lands must be soil sampled. And where soil samples are not taken. Uh, a P index four uh, um, is assumed. And just in relation to, to the soil samples, they're deemed to be valid for four years uh, once they've been taken after the 15th of September, 2019. Um, so, and then they're deemed, so they're deemed to be valid for four years. However, it's the most recent, the results of the most recent soil samples are, are the ones that are, uh, 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 that should be provided to the department. Uh, maybe moving on then around the whole buffer strips and in relation to to the buffer strips maybe just to call out that regarding uh, uh, um, all land um, the two meter buffer strip has now moved up to three meters so there's now a three meter buffer strip required for chemical fertilizer applied in all land and specifically if we look at tillage for a moment again that two meters is, has, 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 has moved up to three meters so there's a three meter uncultivated uh, buffer strip for arable crops with a six meter un uncultivated buffer to protect uh, intersecting water courses for late harvest crops, the likes of maize, uh, um, um, sugar beet uh, and others. So maybe if we just spend a bit of time on the derogation. Um, I mean, the first thing to say to, to everyone watching in is that, look, our derogation is in place until the end of 2025. And that in itself, you know, is, is a significant outcome in terms of the derogation actually being in place. So currently, uh, there's ourselves here in Ireland, there's Denmark, uh, there's the Netherlands, and there's the Flanders region of Belgium, who currently have a derogation in Europe right now. So to have secured a derogation, that's now in place until the end of 2025. However, there are additional requirements. The first one is that there's a requirement around a two-year review of water quality. 
um, and where the water quality is unsatisfactory or deteriorating, there's potential for the maximum um, um, derogation threshold to reduce from 250, where it currently stands, to 220 from 2024 onwards. Um, the, there is currently a review around the water quality taking place, and that's scheduled to be finished out and concluded by the end of September this year, so by the 30th of September. And that will inform uh, where and how many, what regions will be impacted uh, if there is going to be this move uh, from 250 to 220. Uh, but suffice to say, the derogation as is remains in place for 2023. We will have a derogation at the end of 2025, but it may be subject to change uh, in terms of the threshold moving potentially from 250 down uh, from 2024 onwards. And so I think my, my, my last slide, Shane, is a really positive one to be finishing on. It is a really just a call out around the sustainability action payment. Um, our, our board um, this time last year made an innovative move of putting in place an 18 million euro annual sustainability action payment fund, which translates to a, a half a centilitre uh, payment to all our suppliers. So for 2022, you will have all seen uh, in your milk statement and in your milk check that you are receiving that half a centilitre as an unconditional payment, recognising the significant amount of sustainability actions you're already taking on your farm. Throughout 2022, we would have communicated to you when we sent you your milk purchasing policy through webinars, at the ploughing, uh, at the various regional meetings around the need to log on to your Tier Lawn Farm Life account, and to declare at least seven actions from the 18 listed here in order to continue to receive and to lock in uh, that half a cent a litre again for this year. The overwhelming majority of you have done this and, and thank you because you're doing the work and it's important that uh, one, your work is recognised, but two, that you, could, that you um, um, receive this half a cent a litre, which is worth on average 3,000 euros to a supplier. For those of you who haven't, uh, we're in the, the final stages now of closing out the sustainability payment. Uh, and to be honest, if you haven't it done, you won't, you'll no longer see that half a centiliter in your milk check from, uh, uh, from, from January on. So for those who haven't, the final call out as I bring, bring to an end my, my piece here, Shane, is go onto your Tier Lawn Farm Life account, uh, have a look there under the milk supply tab, you'll see um, a drop down, uh, you'll see a, a, a wording there called sustainability action payment. In that, you'll see the 18 measures. Select the seven, the seven actions that you've delivered on your farm during 2022 in order to continue to lock in that half a centiliter. A euro saved is as good as a euro earned. And in this context, the importance of recognizing your actions and not leaving that half a cent behind you. So Shane, that's me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thomas. That's 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 excellent. Great update. Um, lots happening in the nitrate space, in fairness. And uh, look, we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll no doubt have some questions on that and we have some in already. Um, so look, thanks to each of you that have sent in questions. Um, we have uh, uh, a few minutes now that we'll go through those and, and don't be afraid to send in some more. I'm sure we'll try and get through them all. 0861803947. And if you want to include your, your name and county. Uh, so the first question we'll go to is one for Eamon and it's on... Uh, it's on uh, wash routines. So it's from Martin O'Reilly in Leash. Uh, if acid wash is due on a milk collection morning, is it best to leave it to allow more hot water for the milk tank and do it in the evening instead? So maybe just where there's challenges on hot water volumes, is it? Um, Eamon, what's the best plan there? Yeah, it's a good question, Martin. Thanks so much for sending it in. Um, the short answer is yes absolutely prioritize the hot washing of your bulk tank on the morning or, or afternoon of, of milk collection. Critical that that bulk tank gets as, as good a hot wash as possible. Um, to go into a little bit more detail on it, in an ideal world, you would have enough hot water to hot wash your milking parlor and your tank on the same day. And as you go into the bigger plants and the, the more requirements for more hot washing of your, of your actual milking parlor, it is critical to have that volume of hot water there where you can do both. So the answer, it's, it's a split answer, Shane. It's, it's priority.
baptize the tank, but you should have enough hot water to do both at the same time. Very good, very good. Um, another one <clears throat> for yourself, Eamon, in terms of the uh, culture and sensitivity. Someone didn't send in their name, but how, how do I send in the samples to test for culture and sensitivity? Um, there are kits, specific kits, specific bottles with labels available for doing milk culturing. These are available via the milk supply managers. If you just touch base with the local milk supply manager, they'll get these sent out to you via lorry or by calling out to you themselves. Once you have the samples, you can either send them back in with the lorry driver. Once they're well marked, leave them out on your bulk tank when, when your milk is going to be collected. Or again, contact your milk supply manager and he'll organize either picking them up or, or meeting you with them. Okay, no, very good. Excellent. Um, Thomas, a couple for yourself. Um, no, no, um, no name on it, but what is the closing date for applying for a derogation this year? And the second one is how, how long are the soil samples valid for? So no names with those. Okay, so so good questions. The first one is, um, so the department will be opening the application process for derogations pretty soon, I'd expect within the next week to 10 days. And as usual, the closing date for getting in your derogation application is the end of March. Um, that's the usual, um, unless they, I, I don't think it's intended uh, um, for them to extend that. So the important thing here is anyone who's looking at, at applying for a derogation again this year, or perhaps because of the banding, might find themselves applying for the first time this year. Uh, typically, that needs to be done by the thirtieth um, by the thirtieth of March. And then, uh, Shane, regarding the second question, will you just throw that to me again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The second one was the soil samples that someone has sorry. done. They didn't say when they did them, but how long are they valid for? Okay. So the soil samples are typically valid for a four year period, so long as they're done after the fifteenth of September, twenty nineteen. So it's it's four years from the fifteenth of September twenty nineteen onwards, but typically they're 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 valid for a four year period. Good stuff, that is great. And Eamon, um, someone's just messaged no name as well. I can't find my herd cert. Where do I get a new one? Again, contact local milk supply manager, and they'll get a cert out to you ASAP via the post. Okay, and. There is another person who has no sample uh, labels in the dairy um, for, the, for the tanker. Um, what do they do to get them? Yeah, it's, it's an important one, actually. If you haven't had any milk collected in, in the last number of weeks, it's something that we might not just be aware of, or there could be sample labels sitting waiting for you in a, in a local site. So again, have a quick check, see if the labels there, if they're not there, contact the local milk supply manager. They'll organise to get new labels printed and sent out to Farm Direct. Good. Very good, Eamon. Uh, John, a couple of questions for you. Um, someone hasn't said anything about which brands they're using, but are products from different manufacturers okay to mix and match? Yeah, yeah, that's that's okay. I suppose it's it's to make sure that if we're substituting or bringing in an alternative from a, a a different supplier, to make sure that we're comparing like with like. So as I said in the earlier presentation, it's to know the actual spec usage rate and the concentration level required. So if we're replacing a seventy percent caustic, make sure we're replacing it with a seventy percent caustic. So irrespective of what it says on the actual drum or the, 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 the difference between suppliers, once we're using like would like, that will work the finest. Not a bother. And uh, another question, no name, um, a product left over from last year, is it okay to use it up at the start of the season? Yeah, and this is probably one that we come across a lot at the start of the season and the tail end of the season. It's uh, using up the, the ends of drums and trying to make sure we have a, you know, use up the older product. and. In an ideal situation, not ideal. So if we look at any of the products that we are getting from preferred supplier and that have um, a qualifying PCS number, all detergents will have a six month shelf life from date of manufacture to date of expiration. So it's a relatively short period. So if someone is in a dry period for possibly two to three months, um, the product is, you know, there is ever potential that that product is now out of date and you could have potential buildup of chlorates and you know, potentially more problems down the line with that product. So not ideal, but if it has been, you know, stored in a correct manner and is within that six month window, it should be okay to use. But 
I would probably use always, especially like as, as Eamon mentioned in his presentation, you know, when you're getting the plant up and running for a new season, getting it off to a good start, nice clean start, I would always be encouraging to use a fresh product. Oh, fair, fair play, John. That's, that's, that's very clear. Um, Thomas, question just in from James. I have 25 acres of barley. Is it the case that I can't use this now? Re my stocking rate. Okay, that's that's a really good question. So the answer is yes, you can, uh, James. Where you're using that, so so when you're trying to understand what's my overall home farm, what's my overall whole farm stocking rate in the context of am I at one seventy, one eighty, one ninety, uh, um, or two fifty? You can use you can use that that arable land, that tillage land, for the purpose of understanding your overall stocking rate on the farm and whether you need a derogation or not, or whether you need to export slurry, for example. Where, where you can't count that is around the requirements for spreading slurry using low emissions, and secondly, around the requirement around soil sampling. So what they've done, uh, uh, one of the changes that's been made um, this time around is they've introduced this concept of the grassland stocking rate. So in order to understand what, what band you're at for the purpose of requirement to spread slurry using low emissions or soil sampling, it's that grassland. So in James's case, he can't include that, that barley ground. He can't include that ground when he's working out. Does he have to spread uh, slurry using low emissions or, or does he have to um, um, soil sample? But for the purpose of determining his overall 170, 180, 190, and if he needs a derogation or if he needs to export, it's the whole farm. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. Pa uh, Pat and Meath has asked two questions. Uh, the derogation, is it in place for 2023 at 250? And the banding, is it based on milk volume or milk solids? But I think you'd said it was milk volume, Thomas, isn't it? Yeah, so, so Pat's two questions. Yes, the derogation is in place at 250 for 2023. Uh, and then by September, by the end of September this year, there's an overall review of water quality and where's it going, which will determine where, which which will determine what the picture will look like for for 2024. Um, and I think, look, regarding regarding the banding, you're right; it's based on milk volumes. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, we have about three or four questions sitting. If uh, you have any final questions, please text them in there in the next couple of minutes, and we'll try and get to them. Uh, Eamon, <clears throat> a question from Kieran and Kilkenny. Starting to calve next week. When should I do the first milk recording? Ideally, look. Obviously, if you're a spring spring calver, home sense spring calver, and you're starting off, you want to have the bulk of your cows calved before you go and do a milk recording. So, ideally, six six to eight weeks around that period would be would be an ideal time to start. In the meantime, there's other things you can do if you have cows that you're conscious of that may be an issue, or if your bulk tank was also coming back high, you can send in individual samples to Central Lab for, for investigation purposes. And as I've pointed out before, use the CMT then on, on those cows to try and identify where the issue is. But important to get the first milk recording done early and catch as many of the cows as you can. So six to eight weeks, Shane, I think is, is ideal. Okay, good stuff. And another one for you, Eamon. Um, it's from Joe. Doesn't say a county, but I, I've had a problem for a couple of years with thermoduric. How do I know if it's the machine or the bolt tank? And he has washed out the airline a few times. Not simple with thermoduric's at times, Eamon, isn't it? No, it's not. And, and it can be difficult to pinpoint and, is, and, and isolate where an issue is coming from. Look, starting point is, is contact with milk supply manager, your local milk supply manager can guide you in an investigation and that and help you out to the best of their ability. It is possible to take samples along various points of a line, be it in a parlor or before a tank, after a tank. These samples are difficult to take. You can get a lot of environmental contamination and our milk supply managers would be highly experienced with, with knowing where to and not to take a sample from and, and do it as hygienically as possible. So best course of action, contact local milk supply manager. Okay, yeah, no, it's different in every farm, isn't it? So, yeah. John, maybe one for you. How do I know, this is from Kevin in Tipperary, how do I know how much product is being used by the automatic tank, tank wash? Yeah, I, I, I have a smile on my face, Shane, when I hear that question because it's a, 
automated automated systems have absolutely been the you know a, a super boost to to labor and efficiency on farms but more often than not passing in by it the, the drum gets the occasional kick once a fortnight to know if there's anything still in it so it's uh it is definitely you know a problem where a product runs out whatever but yeah so it some of the some of the suppliers actually have individual drums that are are, are mark giving indications of the, the actual volume of products so the simplest thing to keep an eye on that not all suppliers provide that service so it's probably just as simple to actually to put a bit of product into the jug and to actually measure in and out the volumes just to make sure it's taking up the required um the, the, the required volume for for the actual requirement for the the, the appropriate wash and maybe just what what once i have the airway just to maybe suggest as well as they're saying just if someone is doing something different with the detergents and changing suppliers or doing something different just to make sure that the fl the lines get flushed out because of different actives and ingredients often we can get the problems that product meeting other products can actually crystallize in suction lines and and lead to further problems and uh, lack of uptake of the required detergents as well so if changing to an alternative supplier or a different active ingredient just to make sure jug of warm water to make sure to flush out the lines that is completely clean and empty before we change over to the new product to avoid any uh, potential problems down the line. No, that's that's 100%. Um, Ian, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, so it's one important point on as well is it's, it's critical to determine how much detergent you should actually be using in the first place. So in order to do that, you need to know exactly how much water you're using in your wash. So just to give an example, most caustic detergents, liquid detergents out there now will work at 0.7 of a percent solution. So if you have 100 liters of water, you're going to require 700 mLs of product into that, into that water to have the right strength of solution. So a critical part of it is get out the measuring tape measure the wash trough. If you're not comfortable doing that, contact your, your dairy technician will know how to do it. Your milk supply manager knows how to do it. But it's a crit critical point is to match what your manufacturer specifications are to how much water you have. Yeah, yeah, no, really good. And if, unless there's any more questions, one last one, it's for you, Thomas, and it's from Thomas, um, with the changes to the banding, the changes to the buffer strips and the changes to the close period, there's a lot of change. What's coming? Yeah. So, so maybe to pick up on one other thing, and I'll I'll, I'll go straight to that question. Um, and from Thomas, an easy name to remember. To remind whoever's doing that milk recording, that's great because it's also an eligible item under the sustainability action payment. It's one of the measures that when you're milk recording, don't forget to declare that action to lock in your half a centiliter. Um, to Thomas's question. The one consistency in this whole sustainability area right now and the uncertainty has changed. We're very much in transition. I think uh, 2023 into 2024 is going to be very much um, 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 looking at what comes out of this review at the end of September regarding water quality to understand uh, uh, where, we're, where we're going to be regarding the overall derogation limit uh, from, from the 1st of January 20, 2020, 2024. I think what I can maybe say to say to suppliers is um, obviously keep an eye on the banding. You do need to engage directly with your 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 advisor, your private planner, your Chagas advisor, because some implications of the of the banding might be you might need to look at exporting. You know, you might it might bring you into into derogation application territory, and this change will impact on you. You do need to look at it in, on on each individual farm farm by farm basis. Uh, and and begin to understand its impact and if you need to do anything extra because there are some additional requirements for example when you go into derogation around fertilizer records and submitting them um, and just be mindful of it uh, and look the importance then of staying on the right side of the regulations to avoid cross compliance penalties um, uh, because look it's and, and and ultimately I think the journey everyone is on is just made huge commitments around slurry storage, made huge commitments, huge commitments to improving the, the rural environment, and that that's recognised in this journey also. Yeah, yeah, no, look, it's a constant journey of change and fairness, Thomas, but <clears throat> great strides being made made on on lots of, of of good initiatives like the low emission slurry spreading and protected area and so on. So we've 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 come a long way and and a lot of actions already being taken and and you know not necessarily overly expensive options that'll 
that really will deliver on uh, on carbon footprint and doing the right thing. So it's uh, it's it's maybe not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of good stuff happening as well. Um, so look, guys, thanks very much uh, to to everyone who's sent in their questions and to all of our speakers. I think we've had a really good discussion across a couple of couple of topics. There is one last question. Um, okay, just wondered one last question. Uh, just wondering about the banding. Only started milk recording late last year. Does that have any effect on things and to do with the sustainability payment? Um, I did it at the plowing. Does that do for 2023? And that's from Joe. I think that might be from the same Joe that had asked earlier. Okay. Um, so, so Joe, regarding the, the last question first around the sustainability action payment, yes. Um, uh, look, thanks for coming on to the tier lawn uh, stand at the ploughing, and we were delighted to be able to help you there. We had the laptops open, and we had we had several hundred farmers over the, over the three days to get onto their um, um, tier lawn farm life account and declare their actions. So, because you've done it there, you locked in the actions, and that means you're the half a cent locked in uh, uh, for 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 twenty twenty three. Um, and then <laughs> regarding the the question on the banding, um, importantly. But um, uh, if uh, if you've changed, so 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 first of all, if you remember, it's the three-year rolling average of the preceding three years, uh, or else the previous year. It's either or in terms of working out your banding. You can select which one. So if I understand this farmer correctly, that maybe he is, he might have changed practices on the farm, maybe he has increased or reduced numbers. In that case, it would seem to suit Joe, uh, maybe to select. The preceding year as opposed to the, the, the rolling three years which might overestimate uh, um, and look in the next um, uh, in the next week the department will be writing out to everyone explaining how to go onto the ICBF website and declare which band they're in so hopefully that that will add additional clarity but in Joe's scenario it seemed to me uh, to be thinking about if he's changed his practice thinking about uh, opting for the preceding year as opposed to the average of the three previous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Thomas. And I think that is the last of the questions now, unless I see something come up on the screen and I haven't. So uh, look, thanks to everyone for joining the webinar. Thanks to all of our speakers, um, to, to John Brennan, to Thomas Ryan and to Eamon Comiskey. Uh, really diverse range of topics in fairness today and a really good discussion. Um, so look, as you know, every single farm is different. So it's, it's bespoke solutions for each individual farm, whether it be on on, on, on nitrates or whether it be on sustainability action or on products or on milk quality and, and dairy hygiene. So look for, for your own farm scenario, get in touch with your local tier lawn representative who'll be able to work you through uh, for solutions and and, 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 and and give the right advice. So I hope everyone has got some good management tips from the webinar today and good information. To close our webinar, thanks to everyone for joining and participating and to our speakers, Thomas, John and Eamon also to James and Brendan and Tom, who've been working on the background to deliver the webinar for us. So thanks very much for joining us today. Talk to you soon and safe farming. Thanks, everyone.